Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I think uh, we're going to get started for today so we don't get too far off track. Hopefully, everybody can hear me and is connected. Um, if you have any trouble uh, throughout, go just uh, refer to the email that Jean King sent out to you with the link. Um, there is actual contact information via email to Mackenzie White, who would be able to help you do some troubleshooting to uh, connect if you're for some reason on but not hearing us or um, can't see the chat or something of that nature. So let's get started today. My name is Rachel Vesputa. I'm the Tri-State SARE Project Director. I want to thank you all for joining us for today's webinar. Of course, in light of the COVID uh, pandemic, we have transitioned our um, or to a virtual field training uh, uh, webinar rather than our in-person field training workshop that we had originally planned for. We are recording the webinar today as well, so it will be posted on our website soon after for your reference and further learning. Uh, the PowerPoint presentation will also be posted um, as well. So to decrease background noise while we're recording, we have muted everyone who is on the call. So if needed, uh, you can type in the chat section at the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Uh, if for some reason you're not seeing it there right now, go ahead and um, hover down by the bottom of your screen, kind of where my mouse is at the moment. Um, you should see a little chat button. Uh, I think it's the third or fourth from the right. Uh, once you hit that, it should populate down in the right hand uh, side, right corner, right hand side of your screen um, so that you can see that conversation going on and people submitting questions and uh, things of that nature. So just as a little background, this workshop is part of the Tri-State SARE Professional Development Project, um, which is a collaborative project among the universities of Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. It is funded through the USDA and Northeast SARE. We are in the third year of this project and focusing our efforts on pasture management and infrastructure this year. Uh, this is the last workshop we have planned for the year. Uh, moving forward into uh, next year and beyond, uh, we will be focusing more on pasture management, um, but specifically how it relates to manure management and soil health. Uh, so you can certainly expect to be hearing from me uh, later this year um, in the coming months uh, as we begin to de develop content for 2021 uh, so that we can start gaining an understanding of your training needs and your learning desires um, as well as uh, thinking virtually and learning virtually, as it seems like we might be moving into that um, even still into 2021. So um, I will certainly be in contact as, as that time comes. Um, for those of you guys who have joined us on other webinars this year, um, our participant feedback and our group discussion today will be pretty familiar to you. I want to thank everybody who, when they were registering for the webinar, submitted your questions. Um, they will be discussed specifically throughout today's presentation. But of course, feel free to submit questions as they come up today uh, during the webinar in the chat box. Um, again, that's the bottom right hand corner of your screen. If it's not there, go ahead and hover um, down below where I'm moving my mouse right now, you should see a chat button. Once you hit it, that should populate on the right-hand side of the screen. Again, do not use the Q&A box. That is not something that we will be keeping track of today. So, of course, I encourage everybody to get in contact with me after today's webinar if you have further questions regarding any of the topics we discussed, and I'll be happy to get you the answers uh, to those questions. All right, so um, we're going to move forward with our uh, pre-evaluation. Um, again, we're using a software program called Slido um, to conduct all of our um, questions today. Go ahead and take a look at the chat box now. You should be able to cl click um, to connect to Slido. Uh, Mackenzie just posted the link, so go ahead and click on that. And then once the web page is up, um, you should be able to enter the access code SARE. Um, capital S-A-R-E, and then there's a series of five questions, um, and once you get to the bottom of those questions, uh, you should see a green box that lets you um, click to send your results in. 
If you have trouble connecting, certainly type in the chat box and we can help you troubleshoot. Um, I'll give everybody a few minutes to do that now and uh, we'll reconnect and get started with today's webinar. All right, hopefully everyone was able to navigate um, to figure out uh, the, or answer the pre-evaluation question. Uh, certainly, I will send out a link um, for the pre and post evaluation questions afterwards if you were um, somehow struggling to answer the questions in uh, real time at the moment. But for now, um, I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce our guest speaker uh, today. She is from um, UMass. Uh, Nicole Burton is a faculty member at the Stockbridge School of Agriculture at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She has over 20 years of farming experience with a focus on organic livestock and vegetable production. Since completing her master's degree in sustainability science, Nicole has focused solely on, uh, sorry about that, on the development of innovative science-based sustainable uh, animal husbandry curriculum at UMass. Currently, her learning program includes poultry and sheep rotations, organic vegetable production, carbon farming systems, and on-farm slaughter. Nicole serves on several faculty committees and is an active member of the sustainable, Sustainability Curriculum Initiative at the university. Nicole also runs a small family farm at her home in Wendell, Mass. So with that, I think uh, just give us a moment to switch over to Nikki's presentation and we will get started. Hi everyone, I'm really excited today to share some information on silver pasture with you. Whoops, what? Whoops, oh, there we go. So as a reminder, our agenda today is going to be talking a little bit about the projects that we have here at UMass. We're also gonna be covering tree considerations and placements and livestock considerations, housing and fencing, grasses and rotation. And if we have time, we will be discussing pigs. So the UMass student or the UMass Carbon Farming Initiative is a collaborative process. I personally work on the livestock and grass, and my colleague Lisa DiPiano works on the management of chestnuts. Since I'm working on the plot every day during the grazing season, I've acquired a much better understanding as to what works and what hasn't worked with the tree management, and have looked into like different ways to improve to make this with consideration of the trees. I've also been a farmer for years, so I have trialed with um, multiple different things at my own place, as well as adding my awareness to working with trees and livestock. My interest in this project started for two reasons. One, because I wanted to develop a model of how we can utilize smaller spaces while increasing diversity of production on the farm. And two, I wanted to give my students an opportunity to be directly involved in raising these animals in a silvopasture system. So the students' involvement includes learning the rotational management, parasitic awareness, marketing, and finances. And each year I choose a manager to then guide the students that are working in the summer with this specific project. They also write up manuals based on all of the information obtained, such as weight gains, costs, and an overall narrative. So as you can see, like we're really trying to pay attention to all of the aspects of this project so that we can combine all of this information and hopefully um, write something up so that we could hand out to farmers so that they can kind of gauge what it would look like in order for them to start and establish their own silvopasture. I do want to point out that we have chosen sheep in our um, silvopasture system. Being at the university is complicated and we are only allowed to purchase animals from the university farm. So our choices are boar goats or sheep. And um, she just seemed to be an easier fit for us with the trees. Uh, we ran about seven of them this year because of COVID. We also started much later in the year than we would had anticipated. We wanted to increase our numbers, but because we weren't even sure if we would have staff to run these animals, we actually downsized. 
Um, I think it's important uh, to recognize the finances of this as well when you're trying to think about establishing this. So I just wanna point out that when we are purchasing these animals, we actually have to purchase them at market value, which means that one lamb for us this year cost $160. I know that you can purchase animals much cheaper than that. So as um, we do write up this thing, we're gonna have to take into consideration that there are variables that we're working with that a farmer may not be working with. Um, I do think it's really important to recognize that this is an important piece of sustainable farming is making sure that you're making money. So we have been able to actually break even each year, which has been great, but we're not generating uh, a lot of revenue. So my colleague that I mentioned before, who was mostly interested in the chestnuts, was also interested in measuring the carbon storage in the soils from this system. So hence the carbon farming initiative. Um, just to briefly touch on what that means, uh, the carbon farming aspect of this project uh, was created because research has suggested silvopasture systems are capable of storing as much as 100 tons of carbon per acre while we're adding crops and animals and we're also encouraging ecological benefits, reduced nutrient runoff, um, erosion, and preventing animals from stress and heat and wind. We are only in our third year. It has taken us this long to actually feel like we have our feet on the ground with this project. So we don't have a lot of that information about the carbon farming placed online. I do have a link at the top so that you could have reference to it because hopefully in the future, we will be um, sharing more information as to what we're gathering, but like I said, it's taken us three years to feel like, okay, we got this. Um, okay, moving on. I just wanted to share, so now we're gonna talk about trees, but I wanna explain why we chose specifically chestnuts. Um, our chestnuts were started from seed. There's 10 different varieties of hybrid chestnuts. The, these hybrid chestnuts are resistant to chestnut blight. The choice of these trees was focused on traits of climate hardiness, nut size and yield, and disease resistance. It is a good fit for um, agroforestry systems because they have deep roots that stabilize and improve our soils and also increase the carbon sequestering that we're trying to work on. So this particular tree works really well for us. Uh, the hope was, so as you're looking at silvopasture, you have a crop of trees and you also have your animals. And so this crop of trees um, with chestnuts is something where we were looking to harvest the nuts to sell to um, our local dining halls and use it as a part of historical cuisine because as you probably can think, Where's, when's the last time you've had a chestnut? Um, we're trying to bring back that cuisine. It also, if you ground up the nuts, you get a gluten-free flour, which is really appealing to a lot of people currently. Um, they also, just for a little fact, they're low in fat and have high in carbohydrates, which I found to be, um, it's nice to know what product you're trying to get out there to the public in order to sell it, especially if it's new, understanding a lot of the nutritional values is important. Uh, their benefit for the animals is supposed to provide wind and sun protection, but I can tell you that we are three years in and there is absolutely no <laughs> sun or wind protection at all. So um, that has taken a little bit longer than we had anticipated um, for their growth, but I guess in perspective, we did start them from seed. We did not purchase whips like small trees. So it's gonna take us a little longer. But in these pictures, you can see like 
that is not our specific silvopasture, but our trees are a similar size. And then in the bottom right hand corner, that's actually how big they can get. Um, also interplanted in our um, chestnut, this is the actual silvopasture. And you'll see what looks like bushes and shrubs. We have interplanted a food forest in amongst the chestnuts. So we have things such as comfrey, sea berry, gooseberry. Um, these plants uh, are semi eaten down by the animals, which we find to be a really good practice to interplant different shrubs with tannins because research also suggests that when they have access to shrubs with tannins, it helps regulate their parasitic levels. So when you are thinking of, because anyone who's raised small ruminants, you know that your parasitic levels is something that you're pretty much monitoring most of the time to, because that is something that um, can kill your animal quite quickly. So when you're thinking of planting, um, establishing a silvopasture of some type. It's really good to think about other things that you could interplant in there. I kind of see it as like a medicinal garden that they get the opportunity to graze upon when they feel the need to. Um, it, it's always interesting when they attack it and they go nuts on a bush, but they've never killed one, which I find to be, um, interesting so they just kind of come back but they're kind of keeping them at bay so we found a lot of benefit with having those plants i've never had an animal die from eating too much of the plant um, at home i run an experiment with a couple of lambs where i let them have free range we have a lot of poisonous plants as well i'm doing it responsibly but it is fascinating how they do not go to the poisonous plants as long as they have enough feed in other locations but they might eat a little bit of it and i think that that's just the medicinal piece that they're tapping into um okay moving forward so i wanted to talk a little bit about um tree considerations and possible trees that you could incorporate into your property if you're wanting to start and establish a uh, silvopasture. So I think that there's a number of questions you need to answer yourself when choosing the trees to plant. So what type of maintenance is involved? So when you're thinking, oh, I'd like to have um, a fruit orchard and run my livestock or animals through it. Fruit does require a lot more maintenance than trees used for timber, um, but fruit does produce quicker than timber does. So there's different trees will increase different maintenance needs. And so I think that you need to recognize that and prioritize what would work best for you. Um, you also need to figure out your primary focus with creating the solo pasture. Are you looking to create a product for sale on top of the animal that you're running through the silva pasture? Are you looking for fruit? Are you looking for timber? Are you looking for a nut? Are you actually looking for fodder, like just growing feed for your animals? And then asking yourself, what crop are you capable of growing, harvesting, and marketing? So for me, it worked out really well here at UMass because I'm not responsible for the tree's well-being. Um, so that's going to somebody else. It's nice to collaborate with other people when you are thinking of establishing something, especially in a situation that might be new to you. Um, if you do choose fruit or not, you more than likely will have to think about spraying, whether it's organic or not. Um, and when you're spraying, so we have an apple orchard here at the Agricultural Learning Center where the silva pasture is. And it's possible that I could run the sheep through the 
small orchard, but I choose not to because I know they spray with copper. Copper is toxic to sheep. So there's those little things that like when you're spraying and what's the timing of your spraying, like the maintenance of the fruit might be a lot more than um, it, you can handle. Um, and what's economically feasible to purchase and maintain? So you might buy a bunch of trees that are quite expensive and then you're trying to learn how to maintain them, but you have to recognize too that not all of the trees are going to actually make it. So we planted ours really close um, and knowing that they wouldn't all survive and that we could take the strongest ones and know that they would thrive. Um, another thing to do is to match the type of tree with the land that you have available. So for example, chestnuts don't like standing water. And in the path in the pasture, silver pasture at UMass in the spring, um, there's a lot of moisture present in the lower half of this plot. So instead of planting chestnuts, we chose honey locust and persimmons two trees that can actually withstand being in really wet, um, moist environments. You will have to evaluate your pasture and land and understand, and it might not even be your land because I find that there's a lot of opportunities if you feel like you don't have an area that could fit this need. There's a lot of opportunities to also lease land and so in that way, you'll just have to observe what that land is growing and what that environment is. Um, if you already have trees, you'll have to learn a lot more about how their needs coincide with the animals as well as the environment. And you'll have to learn how, to, you might even have to thin out and you might have to hire someone to actually thin out. Um, here I have listed a few possible trees that might work in a situation. You can see that they're all um, planted differently. Some of them are in rows, some of them are kind of more in a grove situation. Locust is really a popular tree. The benefit of locust is that some people on organic farms use it as fence posts because like cedar, it doesn't break down as quick and they cannot use pressure treated um, wood. So locust has um, become of interest for people, but unfortunately it's actually considered invasive in Massachusetts, Connecticut and Maine. I know that there's people out there managing it in some capacity and it is um, a marketable timber, but just wanted to point out that even though it's really interesting, hardy, resistant, and uh, it's still uh, in considered invasive. Um, a couple others that I didn't point out but are really great too are alder. Uh, it's great at fixing nitrogen in temperate climates. It offers like uh, high protein fiber for animals, firewood, and um, some people might use it for mushroom cultivation. Also is willow. Uh, it's highly adaptable and it produces uh, condensed tannins. So we talked about tannins before being beneficial for parasitic control, which is helpful. And then there's also black walnut, which is um, nutritious nuts and timber. So I don't know what, okay. I just wanted to show this. Some plantings require mulching and maintenance. So as you can see, this is um, an earlier picture of our silva pasture. And you can see that the trees were planted, but then there was a bunch of mulch that had to be placed along the rows. Um, planting them closer uh, has proven to be pretty much a pain when I'm trying to move the animals, but it's also allowing us to see which ones will thrive more than others. And as you can see, there's no shade. <laughs> and um, another thing that we discovered right off the bat is that our sheep love, love, love to eat chestnuts. And so the first thing they do is run right to that chestnut if we fence them in with it. 
So that has proven to also be problematic with younger trees because they're the same height as the animal and they can destroy it. So we've had to um, protect them. I'll go over like different tree protections as well and ones that we found worked and ones that we found didn't work. But as you can see in here, I'll also cover housing, but we have to use a shelter in order to provide shade for the animals. So that brings me into spacing and shade cover, because there was a lot of questions concerning shade cover, which are totally great questions to ask, because as the trees grow, so will the vegetation below them. We um, have a lot of sun because the trees are small right now, but I know that the understory will change as the trees grow. Pasture plantings will look different than transitioning a standing lot. Um, spacing is uneasiest, as I said, when it's wider for fencing purposes, but um, it will also depend upon your goals and the animals that you're using. Um, one thing that we took into consideration with our uh, spacing of rows was we had to make sure that our equipment could get in there. So there are there has been a few times that we've had to come in and mow, and we wanted to make sure that we could do at least two passes with the mower and a large tractor. So we didn't want to make the rows too narrow, and so. Uh, we had to take that into consideration. Um, research does say that 50% of the canopy is about 20% less productive than open pasture. So you can assume that if your canopy, um, which they do say like let in 50% of the visible sky in order to enable grasses to grow underneath, so you can assume that once your trees are that large, or if you're creating a standing um, a silvopasture from a standing forest and you're thinning out, that your production is going to be less in pasture. Um, you might wanna talk to a forester if you are choosing to transition into um, the area of thinning out your forest because there's, a, a lot of choices to be made as to which ones to choose. Um, this, I like this chart. I, I brought this up for you because I do feel like there's a lot of factors that come into what, uh, how much shade is going to be provided. Um, so as you can see here, I actually don't have my pointer, but spacing at the top, is like how much, how many feet you're spacing yours, and then it'll do the um, the um, canopy diameter. And then this is a really great way to actually find out how much shade you're going to be experiencing, depending upon how many feet, how many acres, and how you're planting yours. Um, I think there was a question, but I'm gonna keep moving forward. So next, I want to cover tree protection. We will talk again a little bit later about what grasses might be um, happening underneath, how you might plant those out. But first, we're going to move on to um, tree production or protection. Sorry. Um, this has proved to be really important in our civil pasture system. Um, I feel like we've learned a lot. There's a lot of options out there um, and it might be dependent upon your setup and who, like what type of animal you're putting in there. But um, we have worked with almost all of these and found all of them to have uh, benefits and detriments. So the top left, it's called, um, hopefully I have these marked right, uh, the rigid seedling protector tubes. They were about 40 cents each. They were cheap. And the thing that we found is that the, they're supposed to be biodegradable. 
And so the leaves will grow up through the holes, which I don't know how long they're actually supposed to take before they break down, but that was not a great feature I felt like because if we if we had like an animal that oftentimes would just walk right over it if we put them in with that specific protection and then it would be bent and but all of the leaves would be through so we'd have to figure out a way to like prop it back up and then they'd eat the leaves around it if it was of interest so it might work in some situations as you can see the ceiling's very small in this particular one and so it's protecting it but it's easily knocked over the middle top is a blue x tree shelter these are more expensive they're about a dollar 40 each um, for the base and it's supposed to help with uh this blue in particular and if you look to the far right there's also another tube uh protection as well and those are supposed to help with um uv rays and create extra protection for them but the sunlight can get in there so the tree is still growing so you're supposed to technically the tall one take off the protection and then all of the leaves and the trees or the branches like then just come out and they're supposed to be totally fine. We have yet to take the cover off, but we have peeked in there and noticed that it has been working. Um, the bottom left is an arbor shield. So this one in particular, you might be able to see it if you zoom in a little bit, but it actually has a uh, rebar, like has little pieces of metal that protrude from that in order to um, protect the tree. It has rebar, I was trying to say before, to, to keep that actual tree protection frame stable. And then the little spikes out there are supposed to protect it from the animals eating, in, eating like stripping the bark, which they can do with the next picture. But, you know, honestly, anyone who's raised animals knows that they love to rub. And so it's possible if you have cows, they might not eat the actual tree, but they might be like, oh, this is a nice little bit of a scratching post. And so they might put body weight onto it and then it might knock it over. So these are things that you need to, to think about when you're thinking of like, am I putting them in with the trees? Am I not putting them in with the trees? Um, so uh, like I said, the one on the bottom right is similar it just doesn't have those barbs coming out um so rubbing and eating is an issue sometimes i find that if they do have one that's like the metal um kind of uh wire going around it is that the sheep in particular will eat to their height and prune the bottom half of the leaves off the tree so you'll have like forage on the top, but they're eating the bottom half. That might not bother you, it might, um, but they can um, eat through some of those mesh holes because they're not um, small enough. So I wanted to show these pictures because um, we noticed that we had fenced the sheep into one area, so we thought we'd put up just quickly some fiberglass posts and um, some chicken wire. I'm like, they won't be able to get to the bark because they will strip the bark of young trees, most animals. And um, they totally knocked that down. It was like, they went in there, the first thing they did was go over to it and then they knocked it down. The picture on the far right, on the top, that is not the same tree. <laughs> but when we did allow them to have access to the tree, we were wondering what they would do. And they completely, ate the entire thing. Um, here are some more pictures of, so of the tubes that we've been using. Um, the, here, let me use, I want to use a pointer, maybe a laser pointer. Okay, that makes it easier. So this tree right here is actually the one that I showed you in the previous slide that they ate down. So it's still surviving. So, um, these are obviously really resilient trees. Um, 
we have loved these tree protections. The tall, we have like a really stable stake that holds it up. And the trees have been growing really well in them. They still have leafage um, in that tube, but we had that windstorm and this happened. We were shocked. We were, we had no idea. So you can see where there's the metal post right here and where we tied it off was right here. So the whole thing just bent and broke and that was not the only one. So there are some that survive, but we did learn that wind was a factor for the trees that we had to pay attention to a little bit more when we we're thinking about tree protection. We really had to make those stakes that were holding that protection up a little bit stronger. Okay, so I'm gonna go into livestock considerations and I'm happy to answer any questions pertaining to trees, tree protection, um, tree placement, any of those questions I'm happy to answer at some point, um, maybe at the end or whenever somebody brings it up. Um, hey, you do have a couple questions about um, some trees and some shrubs. Did you want to answer them now or do you want to wait until the question and answer session? Um, well, I can try and answer them now. Because okay, we have about 15 minutes before we break, but we can change that a little bit based on, you know, where we're at in terms of a good spot, but okay. um, I can field them to you now and then you can let me know uh, if you want to answer them later or, or what have you. Um, okay. But the first one is asking what shrubs are recommended um, when, you, when you were speaking about using shrubs with tannins, what, which ones do you recommend um, to be planting? Right, so we, um, I have found in the past that um, wormwood seems to be a good shrub that I have used. Um, gooseberry seems to be a shrub that has been used. Um, we have had sea berry, but I feel like they haven't eaten it a ton, but they have eaten it some. And so you have to understand that a lot of these are dispersed throughout the pasture so they're not having access to it all the time. And I do feel like parasitic loads come on at different times. And so they might be in a specific pasture with um, say comfrey and um, gooseberry or currants or something or blueberries. And then they go for that tree dramatically, but then you move them to another pasture with that and then they're done. Right, so I think that making sure that you have diversity within your paddocks is really important because you might find that they really need it. And then at times you might also find that they don't, so they're not eating it a lot, but that doesn't mean that they won't do another rotation through that paddock and not feel the need. So I do, <clears throat> we also have had, um, as you can see in here a little bit, um, we've also had, them eat a lot of the trees. So those, cause those are producing a lot of tannins as well. So as I said, you might find like a willow might be a nice one to have in there for a tree. You might wanna not only think about shrubs, but also planting trees, um, interplanting them with your um, pasture as uh, a tannin producing um, shrub or tree for them. But if you look up anything, like if you just Google tannin producing shrubs or trees, like you'll probably get a good base. But like I said, I find that they go um, in and out of what their needs are depending upon the time and what paddock they're in. Sure, okay. that makes sense. Second question for you, Nikki, is, um, and it, it's prefaced with this might be out of your area of knowledge, but, um, Black locust is native to the U.S. just south of uh, New England in Pennsylvania. And mm -hmm. with the changing climate, it seems natural that its range would be moving northward. That said, um, why is it still considered invasive? Yeah, I don't know. And I feel like there, um, I do know of some black locust farms. <laughs> that sell it. So I don't know if there is some kind of permit you can acquire in order to grow it, but I 
I don't understand why. It's not in Vermont. I know a lot of black locust um, farms in Vermont, and I'm, I don't, I have no idea. I would suggest planting it or reaching out to somebody who might have an idea as to gain a permit for it. Because it is a really beneficial wood and it would be really great in a civil pasture system. Great, cool. Those are the two questions I have um, so far, Nikki. I'm sure there'll be more that come in, but um, I think maybe just pick up where you left off. We have about 12 minutes before we're scheduled to break. So um, just so you know. Yes. So first I'm going to talk about um, some livestock considerations, like what animals are you choosing for your area? Um, you want to really think about where your interest and knowledge might be in. So if you're brand new to animals in general, like what animal are you really attracted to um, and feel that you can manage and handle? Uh, they are tools for uh, managing land, but they're also living tools. So we need to remember that they have a lot of needs outside of just eating grass. Um, so sheep. Sheep are great. They're cute and people like seeing them, but they tend to graze really low. So you have to be on top of your rotations. Um, in order to avoid them destroying uh, the pasture. They also need protection from predators. So making sure that your fencing is really good uh, is important, as well as you might have a guardian animal in there. They um, do have a specific market. So like we're talking about like the whole picture, the whole animal. Um, and so you're gonna have to either sell your animals live um, for their wool or for their meat. And you should probably develop a market for their meat because it's a little bit more specific, say, than pork and beef or chicken. They will eat trees and bark, and but I do find that they have fairly low water needs when they're on pasture. So I'm not lugging out a bunch of water each time we have to do chores with these guys. Um, parasites are an issue, so making sure to keep ahead of their parasitic cycle is important, and I'll probably bring that up again when we talk about rotations, but we oftentimes try and rotate every four to five days to try and beat that cycle. Um, goats are pretty, oh, this is fuzzy. Goats are pretty similar to sheep, but um, they do have a preference for browsing. Um, so tree protection is important. As you can see, this goat is standing up in order to get some of the leaves on top. Um, I've seen sheep do this too. So it's not that it's only goats. These are specifically meat goats. So, um, they might act differently than a dairy goat would, just to bring that to mind. They do need protection from the trees. They can strip bark off trees, obviously, especially young trees, but that doesn't mean if they're not pushed enough in a plot where they're not finding that their feed is low, they, wouldn't, they could possibly also strip a mature tree of bark as well. Where did my other one go? Okay, so chickens. Um, as you can see in here, chickens are great. Um, they, you can have, you might probably need to close them in at night because of predation. Um, you could also have a dog. Uh, they will need to be closed up at night. So you'll probably have to have some kind of movable shelter out there for them. <clears throat> and you'd also have to have fencing of some type unless you had like a really great dog. Um, they do at times I've found when I've put my chickens, I, I like to put my young chickens into tree areas because I know that they're pro not producing yet. And one thing I found is that they actually find that they like to roost in trees. <clears throat> So this tree farm obviously doesn't have a lot of lower branches, so they might not have that inclination to do it, but it's just something to think about 
is that if you're putting it in an established orchard or whatnot, that they may start to roost in the trees. They will eat parasites and bugs in the soil. And so it's really nice to use them as uh, animals to follow up larger ruminants, um, like cows, they'll break up their patties, their dung patties. And so they'll be helpful in that way of parasites. I, I find that in orchards, I like to have them there because they will go for a lot of the bugs that might go for your trees. They'll go for those in the soil and hopefully decrease the number of pests. They are really good at clearing land. So um, even though you might like put them out on grass and whatnot, you can expect if they're there too long that they'll probably eat all of the grass and scratch up the land. They also will create dust bowls. So um, if you're bringing a tractor through and you find that and you leave them there for a long period of time, they might create these little divots in the land. So those are just some things to think about. But otherwise, I feel like they're really good um, animal to have in the silver pasture, but I like them in combination with other livestock. <clears throat> Geese are great. Um, they are great for sustaining off grass, um, but for those of you that have raised them, you know that they might have an aggressive side to them. They might be great in combination with um, another poultry, such as ducks, because they are good at protecting. Um, they have similar needs as ducks, and so they need access to water other than like a typical poultry water because they need to clean themselves. And so as ducks and geese, you're going to have to provide, uh, <clears throat> sorry, you're gonna have to provide a bowl of water. They can produce eggs and meat, ducks and geese, and they are really good in specific systems. So some people might use them with mushrooms. Um, and also follow them up with after, say a cow or a sheep or a goat have gone through an area. They um, are really good and I wish I had them this year because after the drought and the rains came, I have never seen so many slugs and snails that it was out of control. And so snails and slugs, they carry um, uh, problems for ruminants as well. And I was really wanting geese or ducks in that situation to come through the pasture and clean them up, but we don't have access to that. So um, it's just something to think about that each of these animals have different benefits to them. So you might find that you want to have eggs and you want to have um, lamb. And so you're going to find a way to work these two animals together, but possibly at separate times because uh, these poultry, chickens, ducks, and geese will require some <clears throat> geese, probably not as much, but require some grain. And then if you're trying to keep you don't want your sheep and your cows and your goats to get into that feed. So that's why sometimes we separate them. Um, sorry, another fuzzy picture. Cows, I love them. Uh, they are animals that only graze down to about three inches. Um, that is because unlike the goat and the sheep that tear with their teeth, they're actually tearing with their tongue. So they will not destroy a pasture, but that's not to say that you want them to go super low all the time. Another thing that's really fantastic about um, cows is that it's way easier with the fencing. They are larger animals, so they may have a bigger demand of space and water and needs, um, but it's much easier to move them through they still should not be in with smaller trees because they could trample them um, or they could like eat them uh, because they need it. So say if you're planting the willow and they're like, oh, a tree with tannins, I'm going to try and eat that. 
Um, so, and, and I guess it depends upon the breed as to how much they're into browsing. Different breeds like encourage that more. Um, their weight could damage the soil if left on a space too long, which can damage the tree roots and cause erosion too. So movement's really important in this. Um, they also like to rub. So I keep saying that about animals because animals really like to rub. I've seen cows have access to trees over a period of time. Like people just put them in the woods, they left them there, they gave them a huge swath, and they literally rubbed the bark off the trees. <laughs> so um, it's something to be aware of, like the importance of moving your animals is going to play a big part um, in your management, but also like the health of your trees. Um, it's important to recognize um, your animal's needs and personalities and, and what their inclinations are before you go and um, put them in the woods. So just remembering some of these small pieces will be important. Um, I will talk about pigs later. I feel like they're a little bit more complicated in the woods. Um, so we'll we'll save that for after. Okay, so moving on to housing. So I think that housing is not something you initially think about when you think of civil pasture because we're anticipating that the trees are going to give coverage for these animals. Um, as you see with the cows, like they will go to where there is shade. And so there's a few things that happen with that particular situation where um, oftentimes when animals are in a plot for a long time and they congregate underneath the same tree, they can compact all of the soil underneath it. So those are some things to think about. The more trees you have, the more spread out they are possibly going to be. But in the beginning, it's really important to give them the opportunity to have shade. And so you might have to provide housing. Um, I have found that even if we did have trees that provided shade, I would still provide housing. And I say this because it is an opportunity. If I have a problem out on pasture, it's an opportunity for me to close them in. So as you can see with the cattle panel in front of um, the shelter where the sheep are, I can close them, like corral them in, close them in, and then handle them as I see fit if there's a problem. Um, it's hard when they're out on pasture if they don't have a routine to capture an animal. Some of you may be close to a barn, which is great, and you can move them into the barn. But sometimes you might find that when you're working in a silva pasture or a woodlot, you're a little bit more in a remote location. So getting them um, contained is a little bit more challenging. Um, I also have found that it makes it a lot easier for me to move the fencing. So I close them in and I completely move all of the fencing to a new location. If I didn't have anywhere to close them in, it would make it really challenging for me to put up extra fencing to then take down the other fencing. So I would always have housing in our situation. Um, there has been times where there's been wind storms as well, and I feel a lot better about putting them into this type of shelter than leaving them out. Um, it also is a way that we could train them to the fence and also a way that when we got them, they were brand new and they had never seen grass. So we're also acclimating them to being on pasture as well. Um, in this particular picture, these are students of mine, um, and we had to put up an extra tarp because the sun, um, when they were trapped in there, they, they didn't get shade at a certain part of the day. And as you can see, those two little water buckets are carabinered to the fence. And we just basically take um, two five gallon buckets with lids and we transport them via truck to get out there. Um, so your housing situation might look different this one was um, 
shelter logic top for like 200 bucks. And then I got three panels from uh, Greenfield Co-op for, I think they were 150 a piece possibly. That was the most expensive part. And then a cattle panel. So overall, it's like a makeshift shelter that really helped us gather everyone um, and do the work that we needed to in the, the silvo pasture. Cows might be different. You might be able to move them a little bit quicker, or you might have your animals trained to move with grain or whatnot. So everyone's situation may look a little different. Oh. That changed up. Um, oh, I just saw something from Nick. Um, do we move the shelter? Yes, we do. It takes um, a few people to move the top off because it's awkward and large. And we move it, um, I'll show later on like what the paddocks look like and we move it um, down the hill and then up the hill so that they're following the rotation. So yes, it does move and it does move really easily. It probably takes us an hour and a half to do that. And I'll talk more about the timing um, as well a little bit later. So I wanna point out too, um, so, we have this plot, this picture in the bottom right. The one thing about having a shelter is having them trample it down and live in there and want to be in the shade all the time. So you're going to get your a plot of <laughs> your pasture to look like this. It usually does grow up, but they have created compaction. They've pretty much destroyed the important pieces of that. So that also comes along with um, having a shelter as well. Okay. Um, I guess this is just another picture of the shelter. That's what I, like preparing to move them. Um, so next I'll talk about fencing. Uh, so fencing, I think that this might be a better one. Okay, so training to the fence. Um, obviously, some of you may have already trained your animals to the fence, which is really great. Um, it may depend, your fencing may depend upon if you're leasing land or not, or if you have them in a more remote location. Because I think that when they're close to the house or whatnot, we're, we're seeing them. And so we're not as concerned. We might get as far as we might get a little lazy with our fence, but making sure that it has a strong charge is really important. I also have a little camera that I put in the shelter to see like who's walking, because I'm not here. This is at the university. It's exposed to whoever decides to walk through. And it's kind of a, a security thing for me, but um, I've seen coyotes. I've seen people and having an electric fence um, has proven to be a great protector for that. Um, so when you are fencing in amongst trees uh, that you're trying to establish a silvopasture in an existing lot, this type of fencing for goats, chickens, um, it's electric and it's um, movable so it's got great versatility in making the space that you want but doing it in the woods is a wicked pain in the butt and it gets caught on everything especially if there is a bunch of shrubs and you're trying to clear them out so just know that this type of fencing is great in certain situations but it can get really frustrating very quick when you're trying to work it in the woods um, that's where when you're establishing something in the woods, you might think about having a cow where you could put up a strand and then it's not grounding out um, on the bottom because these fences specifically, um, if you can kind of see where there's like a line that I had weed whacked, it's like a little bit um, like brown. So I weed whack and then I put the fence on it because if any grass is touching it, it's gonna ground out. And if it's going to ground out, then I'm going to lose charge and then I'm going to make them more susceptible to predation. Um, so just know that strands are a lot easier to move around the woodlot than not. Um, I think this picture here. So in the beginning, I was really scared about having these animals out on this farm with nobody there, like nearby that was responsible for them. 
So what I ended up doing is putting up this fence line and then you can kind of see this top line up here. I put another electric line on top in case any animal felt inclined to jump. Not to say that this would stop them because if they're in the air, they will not be shocked because they're not connected to the ground. But I feel like it was a visual um, barrier. Like it said, don't jump because there's a line here. At least I was hoping that that's what it was going to do. I eased up over time and I trusted the fact that the fence, um, because we were more remote, I got the height of a goat fence. Um, they sell them goat size, they sell them sheep size, they sell them poultry size, they're all different heights. But I tried to find the tallest one so that I could feel a little bit more comfortable about the coyotes that were roaming around this farm. Um, so the thing with this, most of the trees for our production are planted fairly close together. And so it, it does make fencing a little bit more challenging. Um, we have to go around corners. So you're gonna have to have a lot of these white insulated posts that are in the middle that are holding that top wire up. Um, it enables you to take corners and go around in awkward little situations. I have started to relax a little bit and subject some chestnuts to the sheet because of management of this type of fencing and wanting them to get enough land to move um, every like four to five days. Um, like I said, you do have a little bit of maintenance with fences such as this because you don't want the grass growing up. So you're weed whacking or you're mowing a line. Um, something else to think about with housing and fencing is water. It's really important. They get a lot on pasture from the moisture from the grass, but how are you going to get it to them is going to be something that you're going to have to work out. Uh, the cows, like I said, have a much higher demand than a chicken. So um, you might have to bring out tanks and just figure out what their needs are but more than likely you're in a remote situation where you're going to have to um, bring it to them. Um, here's a fencing for um, East. As you can see, like the squares are a little bit smaller. I won't go into detail too much about the fencing, but I think that it's such an important factor that I couldn't leave it out of this presentation because I think that um, not only is it an investment, but it's also a learning curve to make sure that you're providing enough charge to keep predation out. And so this is a picture of what you would need for cows. You can train your cows to one strand. It's awesome, super easy to navigate in the woods, and it's not even close to being um, near the grass, so you don't have to worry about it grounding out. You just gotta make sure that it's on and hot. So next we'll move on to grass. So I did provide this link in this slide. I found it to be a really great resource because I do think that it's important when you are trying to start something or establish something in a pasture or an a old lot or whatnot. I think it's important to be able to identify what you have. And so this guide is a nice way to, um, I find it to be easy to navigate. And so that should hopefully be a really nice resource for you. Um, so some things to think about, are you working with what you have? So do you already have a pasture established? Are you working with regenerating old pastures? Are you conversion? Are you creating a conversion of a hay field to pasture? Um, this particular picture is the top part of our silva pasture. It's amazing. The sheep love it. It's like a great mix. So I really lucked out with that top part of it. But it's really all about the location, your soil, the light availability. And as we've talked about with the trees, that that changes over time. So being aware of what you have there and what might survive and what might be challenged is important. And knowing, um, yeah, so knowing the time of the grasses may change. And then, so if you are thinking of uh, 
changing your grasses, um, there's a number of ways to do that. Um, but oftentimes I find in silva pastures, you might broadcast or use a brilliant cedar or um, there has been, I have seen a farmer successfully convert woods into a silvo pasture situation by putting out hay for the animals in the woods. They eat it down, but the seeds were dropping to the ground. So the following cycle, um, there was actually seeds already there with mulch on top and the grass grew up and it looked really nice. So I thought that was kind of a neat method. It's also taking the investment of putting hay out and making sure that it has seed heads available to be seeded out. But um, that's there's a number of different methods, but it's gonna really depend upon if you can work with what you have or if you feel like you need to add in things. Um, okay, where am I? Oh, here, sorry. So I, I just want to talk a little bit about tall grass because I know that there's different theories and approaches to having tall grass. So in this picture, can you see the sheep? <laughs> They're like the little white pieces in there. That's how tall the grass is. Um, this year, because of COVID, um, we received our sheep really late and the grass was super tall. Um, some folks will graze out tall grass instead of mowing it. I found that with the sheep specifically, um, that it's harder to clear an area for the fence and the regrowth, it tends to be slower unless all the grass is lying flat. So I often will mow, um, to help myself with this. These fields that we're, we've been using, um, were once hay fields. So the mix is geared towards hay production. So more than pasture production. Um, <clears throat> so there's Timothy, orchard grass, ryegrass, tall fescue, clover. I mean, some of these are found in pastures as well, but Timothy can grow up to five feet tall. So you're like, usually in pastures, we won't have um, Timothy planted. It's just a really tall plant that you'll see more often in hay production. So recognizing if you are transitioning to a hay field, um, just know that you're going to be working with different species. Um, let's see what this is. Okay, so here's another picture of the tall grasses. So this year, um, I moved them through all of this tall grass. And as you can see, they didn't do a great job with getting it all down it seems a little bit spotty. So they were like left all of the tall stuff behind and, um, and did really well in some areas. So we have some weeds over here. And then there was one area that they didn't get to, but the wind, as many of you have seen in hay fields or just like time and, and maturity will make it go flat. And so, this makes it really hard for them to access the um, grasses that are underneath. But you can kind of see um, a little bit in the front here how it's starting to grow up. It was so tall on the lower half and there are different grasses down here. So this is kind of the divide of um, grasses for us. Uh, so I mowed this because I didn't want to have to navigate the tall grass. And I was really happy I did so because it came up, it was really beautiful and um, the sheep were getting a more nutritious feed. We tend to plant cool season grasses in the Northeast and it will, like I keep saying, it'll be dependent upon your soil type, the climate and the sun exposure. So it might be worth just getting a, a soil sample to see where you stand. You can kind of gauge what's what your soil type is by the species that are growing in it as well. So just being aware of what's already there is important. Um, the, so the upper plot of the UMass farm is like a nice grass and the lower half is stays really wet throughout the spring. As I had said before, why we planted something different than chestnuts. 
which changes the environment for grasses. So we have a lot of canary reed and orchard grass, but no clover. And there are some ferns um, the closer you get to the hedgerow as well. And no matter how many times we've um, grazed that, we've still had um, that outcome of uh, grasses. We um, are, have talked also about seeding out some clover here to see how it does in the, the wetter season. We don't move the animals down into the lower half until it's dried up a little bit, but clover is one of those seeds that you can broadcast and it takes a little while to um, germinate, but it's really uh, can survive for a while. I often will frost seed um, out at my place if I find that my clover has declined in um, numbers. So I'll broadcast like towards the end of winter and then it'll actually germinate and come back up for the spring. So I'm a little bit ahead of the game. That's also an option if you wanna bring in some legumes to the area, because those are really beneficial. Each animal, I think that it's important to recognize that there are professionals out there that create seed mixes for us. And so be it online or at like the Greenfield Co-op in my area, they have mixes that are specifically for um, say a sheep or specifically great for a cow. So kind of tapping into what those mixes look like. There's also like specific um, grass mixes that are really great for pasture renovation. So just knowing that there's professionals out there that are creating these mixes for us is a great resource that we can tap into. Um, so as I said, when the grass gets tall, the sheep tend to eat the seed heads and not like the actual stalks. So they're looking for the most nutrition and energy, which is in the seed head, but not in the stalk. Um, and the understory is hard for them to reach. Uh, one thing that's important to remember with rotational grazing, that it's important for um, the livestock not to graze too low, just like you don't wanna mow too low. Um, this allows for the grass to keep its root structure and also grow back in a um, timely manner. Um, this was the lower half that I mowed. Um, as you can see, this is another part of the management that comes into play. You might, um, so I, I mowed all of that down. It was really tall and you can see the rows. So in amongst those rows are, you can kind of see them like the tree protectors, but then your trees are also submerged in a massive amount of grass. So you will have to go through and we back around because after a year, I think that we planted this out last year. So there was a bunch of mulch put down, but it didn't last. <laughs> And so you either have to reapply mulch or you're gonna have to maintain it by weed whacking it. Um, where am I? And it is interesting how different the upper plot of this acre is versus the lower plot. Um, so this is um, a, a slide, it looks like they um, grazed really low, but they didn't necessarily, but you can see the difference between um, where they had grazed and where the grass was growing up really high. Um, I think this, uh, so this is the lower pasture and the upper pasture is in the left-hand side. Um, you can see where I mowed, I, the, all the grass is staying there. It's also um, providing a little bit of more it's just gonna stay there. The grass is gonna grow up through it. It's all gonna be good. Um, I wanted to show this slide because this is something that I find that happens a lot. Like it might look really nice to have um, your pasture, they graze it, but then you notice like there's an undesirable plant in your pasture. So say if, I'm not saying that this is in particular, but I'm just saying that you'll find that you'll get weeds and you don't know where they came from. It could have been dropped by a bird or whatnot. So undesirables sometimes show up. Um, if you don't mow this, then it will have the, or weed whack it, it will have the opportunity to regrow and or seed out. So those are some things that you wanna think about. I know that 
for some people, they don't have a mower or they don't want to, but there is some kind of management that does need to happen in order to keep the species that you want in your pasture, in your pasture. <laughs> um, so I wanted to go back to um, the, or wait, this. So as I was saying, I don't really let them get down to past four inches. Um, and we do try and move them every five days to an attempt to beat the parasitic cycle. Um, this is not to say that they won't revisit the plot, but we're trying to move them so that they're not, it will be usually like a month before they revisit that. Um, and as you can see here, like this was uh, grazed out and then the regrowth has already started on the other side. We do try and move our sheep. So here in the pasture is actually comfrey that was just placed in there. Um, so they can use that um, and benefit to them if they have, same for adults, I mean, as humans, um, if they have like sore muscles or um, aches and pains, it can really like help with that piece. And it's like, holds a lot of nutrition. But we do try and move the sheep, as I said, two times a week. Um, it usually takes, we have a maximum of three fences that we're moving. Um, this is a really good number for our fence charger. So three fences set up really well will produce about 4.5 thousand volts, which is good enough for them and good enough for predation. So, we're matching the number of fences we have to the actual charger. Um, so this is another picture of what might happen after they go through with the undesirables. Here's some milkweed and they're kind of just like picking through what they want the most. This regrowth happened um, within like two weeks. It was incredible. So sometimes if you get the healthier pastures, we haven't been fertilizing it. The only thing that they're getting is grazing. The pastures are like being grazed as well as manure droppings, but the regrowth we're seeing is phenomenal. And so the healthier your soils are, the healthier that your systems are, the better the grass will be. Um, here's another picture I just wanted to show you of how it looks. It doesn't even really look like much. But um, you can see the grass, it's all pretty even, which has been, um, that happened without mowing. We did not mow um, last year. We caught it in time in order to not have to mow. Um, you can kind of see the line here on this one. You can also see like all the trees and the shrubs that we have. This was a, at a time when we had a little bit better mulching system. But you can kind of see with the shed or the shelter, like how wonky the fence is. It kind of like goes in and out. So knowing, making sure that you have enough fences to work that land. We, we have the house on one side and we basically place it in the middle so that we're rotating it around um, the whole area that is provided around that shelter. And then we move the shelter and we basically do a whole other square. So we're trying to do two rotations of the shed and then we go back and forth and back and forth. Um, so I, I feel like I wanna touch a little bit, I'm not sure, oh, whoops. Touch a little bit on developing silvopastures from your woods. Um, I'm gonna show the book at the end, but if you haven't already gotten or heard of the book, Silvo Pasture by um, Gabriel, um, Steve Gabriel, uh, I really highly suggest you get it. He goes into depth about how to create your Silvo Pasture, like what trees to thin, what you're looking for in trees, like he's an agroforester, um, I believe. And so he's got a lot of that information that would be really beneficial for that. Um, one thing that I have found sometimes successful and other times challenging is getting the seed to perform as I want in that. I have found that planting in the spring is the best because leaf coverage has not fully come in. 
and there seems to be a lot more rain and these are more isolated locations. And so when I'm planting after I've cleared the land, the animals have done their job, the pigs specifically, um, I will then seed out and I've found more success in the spring. Um, and then you also have the trees that like we save all of our oaks so that the acorns fall down and the pigs get that opportunity to eat all of the acorns or, and so when I'm doing that, I don't wanna have seed down, I wanna have grass. So I'm trying to time, I always wanna plant in the spring and then I want them to be able to um, get the harvest in the fall. So trying to time those are really important factors. Like I said, I've broadcasted in there. That seems to work pretty well. I've also tried the method that I told you about where you can lay down mulch and hay. And um, especially if an area seems a little rough, I'll tend to do that. Um, sometimes I even fertilize if I find that the soils are a little bit too acidic because I will test them. So say if I had a lot of pine in my forest and I'm getting rid of that, and I'm just keeping my oaks, I might have a lot more acidity than I really want. And so I might add um, lime to it or add supplements in order to try and balance that out before I throw down seed. So I'm not spending hundreds of dollars on my seed and wasting it because the germination and growth is poor. So starting with the soil and recognizing that is really important. Um, so I, I'm gonna try and show you a picture, sorry. Um, let's see, I wanted to show you. Oh, sorry, I wanna show you this. Okay, so I just wanted you to get an understanding as to like kind of an overview of what we're working with. So I find that these maps are really great to have, especially when you're trying to figure out where you're planting things and what would work best. So Google Earth is amazing. We, hopefully you have access to it. If you're looking at a plot and you're trying to figure out what to plant and where to plant it, a lot of times you can see or you can request where it's really wet um, and where there's like openings and where there's trees and then it makes it a little bit easier for you to place out. So we used to have the sheep move down to the silvo pasture because of fear of students harassing them. <laughs> it was more of a, a protection in the beginning when it was a pilot project. Um, but as you can see here, this is where the silvo pasture is and then here is waterway. And this is also wet. Our vision is to move the silvopasture, expand it, and bring it over here. But this area is only going to let us plant certain things. So having a map is of your land is really helpful when you're trying to place some things out. Um, okay, bear with me. Good. Is this what I want? Nope. Play from start. Oh no, sorry. <laughs> Bear with me for a second. I'll get there. Okay, so I wanted to make sure to show you another perspective of what this plot looks like. It was really helpful um, for us to not only have the aerial of Google Maps, but also to lay out and measure each pasture. So we actually knew how much land we were working with and how much each um, block was. And so this pretty much comes out to about an acre. Um, I do suggest having a backup place. So oftentimes if you're working with developing a silver pasture in a woodlot, you might have it right next to a pasture. So you have like a backup land, right? So um, in case it's like I, we do our rotation, we do our first rotation here, and we do our second rotation around our shed here. Um, sometimes this is not ready. 
And so we move them to the backup plot and that gives us a little bit of time. And then we move them back up again. You can see where we have the chestnuts and then the soil changes. And so this is where we have the honey locust. Um, another perspective to give you is this has been our rotation. So as I say rotations, I'm saying that there's a, ha a shelter in the middle and we're rotating them through all of these paddocks. So from May 15th to June 10th was 27 days. We moved seven sheep through this area. Then they moved down here from June 10th to July 6th, another 27 days. And then we moved them back up again. And so they spent 31 days here. And so um, then they're going to move back down. So we've had the opportunity, the grass has been growing back really great to be able to rotate them back and forth. We found that seven sheep um, growing on an acre of land seems to be a good fit. I think we could push it a little bit more because we do have more backup land. If we decided to raise like 10, I think that that would be okay. But, um, but it seems to be a nice sweet spot to have it between seven and 10 with an acre of good producing grass. Um, I also have here the food forest hedgerow, just to tell you, so along with having food forest shrubs throughout these, we also have a hedgerow that also prevents like big wind coming through. That has been really great. We also have bees over here. Um, and so we measured out each pasture to figure out the acreage. And that was helpful. So this is kind of, I just wanted to show you, this is like really lazy how I did this, but um, so our shelter is here in the middle and this is usually what um, our fencing will look like um, in the yellow. It's kind of just like moved over and then we'll kind of just like go around these spots um, as best as we can with three fences. <clears throat> Hey, Nikki, I just wanted to give you a, about a five minute heads up. Okay, so um, do should I enter into a little bit of pigs, kind of run through them a little bit? Um, I have about three questions for you. So I think we could cut down some of the question and answer time. If I know there were some people who were interested at pigs, so if okay. you wanted to get into that. I'll, I'll, yeah. be, I'll be quick. Um, so just to let you know, pigs have become a really big interest amongst everybody and in wanting to put them into a silvopasture system. Um, so I wrote a grant and I've received a grant to, um, it was supposed to happen this summer, but it's happening next summer because of COVID, um, to implement pigs into a silvopasture system to regenerate um, the wood plot into a silvopasture plot. So just know that we're gonna be acquiring a lot more information that we can share with you all, hopefully starting next summer. Um, so um, pigs are awesome. Pigs also are extremely destructive. Um, they create, like using pigs, they, there's a loss of surface forages, there's a loss of soil humus layer, they, um, their soil compaction, there's a significant loss of soil structure and nutrients. There can create runoff and soil erosion and a destruction of the soil biotic of the community of the forest. So that all being said, I'm not saying that they're awful, <laughs> even though it kind of sounds that way. Um, so know that they can be really beneficial, but there is a balance and you have to find that balance. And so that means moving them a lot. They do need shade during the summer um, and they are capable of eating insects, roots, um, nuts, plants. So they can be really appealing and they can also benefit from, you know, the masting of any kind of, um, mostly here we use uh, acorns, but they could take fallen apples. There's a lot of things that they can help us with. Um, they're great too because they only need strands of fencing which is really great but as you can see in this picture they've really cleared out the land 
these are, so I took these pictures of some of my pigs um, because I wanted to show, we put them on this pot that, this woodland pot that we had thinned out. Um, and in the picture, there's something in the way, I can't see that picture, let me see, if I, oh, there we go. So I took a picture of this oak. Um, from a distance, it looks okay. If you go up closer, you'll start to see on the bottom right that they really ate away at that, the base. They probably were there for a little too long. What it should look like is the one on the left, right? And so that tree in particular was hard to fence out of the situation. So this one we did fence out and so it could keep that. What does that mean? That means that we might not get um, a good production of acorns in the fall, right? It might take away from this year or it might take away from next year because that tree has to regenerate again and like get its footing. So um, there's, they're really great at doing their job. Uh -oh. there we go. But sometimes it's hard. Here's another picture of another um, part of our land that we have. Um, so it started off looking like this. Leaf matter can often be problematic when you're trying to plant out a pasture in woodlands. They did a really nice job of kind of clearing it out. They didn't tap into the trees too much. But here you can see that they really dug up some roots. They were left there too long. It's hard when you're farming to find the management and the time to like get them out. But we wanted them to really destroy it so that we could have half of it be pasture and half of it be woodlands. So you can kind of see there's a line where the woodlands look a little different than the one that's closer. But there's a lot of shade, which is great. Um, not sure why I have this picture right here, but um, I did want to show it's kind of like a panoramic. So this is what they had done last time we had to create a pasture. They cleared it, we seeded it, it came in really beautifully. And then this is what they're working on now. Um, just to show you also a visual of what pigs can do. There was nine growers um, on a quarter acre of land. And this was the growth that was there. And this was um, like maybe a, less than a month later. So you can see that it's a pretty, they do a pretty dramatic job, but they did a really nice job with clearing things out. And, um, but you have to just be really careful with the trees. So hopefully the research that I'm gonna be working on next summer will be of benefit to everyone. And um, yeah, I'll just finish up with pigs there and we can move on to questions. I just wanted to make sure to say those few things. Um, okay, Nikki, so I, well, first, uh, just to everybody who is uh, still with us, if you have any specific questions, feel free to um, type them into the chat now and we will um, make sure that they get answered or at least addressed. Um, I will start with the first one we got um, back when we were discussing the types of um, animals, Nikki. So there's one participant wondering about turkeys in an apple orchard. Do you have any uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, that might be great. Um, I mean, Turk, I didn't mean to eliminate turkeys. They're just part of poultry in my mind. Um, that could be great. The one thing, like I said, is depending upon what breed you have might depend upon how much of a rooster they are. So if they can get in the tree, that might be problematic. The other part of an orchard, is it a production orchard? Because the feces, like depending upon if you're using drops, they can help clean up. But when it comes to food security, sometimes that is a little bit problematic, is just in the food safety way. But it's for if it's for your property, totally. I would totally do it. And um, they could help just as much as any other poultry with managing that space. And like I said, it's breed dependent upon their uh, inclinations, like how much are they going to graze in the pasture and how much um, they'll like leave everything alone. So I think that turkeys are great because they're much more efficient at the conversion of feed. And so I encourage that for sure. 
and then um, again from the same participant, do apple trees need protection from sheep once they are large, you know, fully grown um, trees? Sometimes. Um, I have had them in orchards where I run them through and as long as they have um, as long as they have enough grass, they're not usually going for the bark. They will eat the leaves, so they might do same as a goat where I have my two roaming lambs that I do my experiments with. They um, have eaten my Asian pear, my apple, and my peach leaves that are all at the level, their grazing level. So they've kind of like managed that piece for me, I guess. But the one thing I did find is that they're pretty good with the bark, but if I decided to house them under a specific tree, the rubbing played a role as well. Um, and sometimes they would get bored, you know, like if they're in the shade in the afternoon, they might nibble on it. But if you give them enough land and enough space and not just one tree, I think that you'd be totally fine and successful. The other piece I just want to point out is that with drops of apples, it's something to take into consideration that um, hopefully they eat as they need, but animals can also get acidosis, um, which is consuming too many apples. So I don't think that that's a problem if you give them enough land to make that choice for themselves, but it's just something to be aware of. Um, another livestock related question, would it be possible to run mixed herds with success? such as cows and goats together? Um, cows and goats, yes. So um, something I didn't touch on was minerals. Um, sometimes we give our livestock minerals in these paddocks, sometimes we don't. Um, as long as they get along, you can. The thing is, is that they will, like it, it might be better to do a follow-up but you could try and put them all together, you know, like their needs are a little different in the way of water, which is totally fine. The cows are bigger, so they're dropping bigger patties and they're also maybe taking the choice because they're bigger and they're eating faster. But I don't see why not. There's no reason why it shouldn't be tried at least. Like there's no signs of like, no, that would be crazy. I think that it would be fine on my perspective at least. <laughs> it's always worth trying, I feel like. You might as well just try, like there's nothing to lose. You gotta find out if it works or not, you know, like they can match, they're match, they can match as uh, animals. So I wouldn't put sheep though, just because of the toxicity and I give them um, minerals sometimes, like blocks for the cows. And so sheep can't have those blocks mm -hmm. because of the copper. Another question coming through Nikki is, will chickens eat sheep worms? Yes, they can. They can scratch through them. Yeah, it's nice to have them. I can't say that they'll eat all of them, but it is possible for them to go through and start pairing out some of that stuff. Um, that's why it's really nice to have them follow up, you know, and I, if you're concerned about a specific plot, I would, make the fencing smaller so that they're concentrating on that plot because they, um, you know what I mean? Like depending upon how many birds you have is gonna depend upon what type of job they do with the amount of land you have. So yes, they will go through. Will they eat them all? Probably not because at some point they get into the soil, you know, and sometimes it's hard for them to get everything. Um, another question, shifting gears a little bit to um, what what has been seen in other countries. It's um, somebody's asking. Spain and Italy have long traditions of finishing hogs on chestnut <clears throat> and oak forests in sustainable ways. It seems the biggest obstacle in this country is short tenure of land ownership. Uh, they have advantages uh, in generations of investments uh, in mass producing trees. How can we overcome this in the US? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I feel like one thing that we need to start doing is reaching out to your neighbor that has land with trees. 
So um, I think that for some reason we think we have to own the land and it's hard to own land because that's one of the biggest struggles, especially new farmers come into, right? Is acquiring land. So something that my husband and I have started doing is reaching out to people in our community and in educating them, but also saying, hey, can we create a relationship with you where we pasture our animals in your plots and we'll help, re as long as we're doing it responsibly, we'll help like regenerate the, the land to back to a farming um, piece. So I think that it's a mentality that um, we need to help people realize that we do have a lot of land and we do have a lot of potential and that people can do it responsibly. And I think that when they think farming animals, they automatically go to large production and that um, stops people. You know, they're like, oh, that's awful, but they don't recognize that there can be a relationship with animals in the land that can be beneficial. So I think that education is really important and also reaching out to your neighbors in your community because folks um, internationally have a lot to share with us. And I feel like we have a lot to, to learn from them and we can use their success to help uh, reestablish our story, right? And so um, I don't necessarily have a full on like solution, but I do feel like reaching out um, to educate people and trying to utilize other people's land and then people seeing it visually will also be an educational piece as well. Uh, another question coming in is, are the, do you have any tips for removing moss from pasture? Mm. I'd go right to your soil. I'd say, okay, what's in my soil um, that's creating this? So it's obviously moisture. Right, so moss wants to be moist. Most of the time you'll find it in the forest a lot. Um, you might have to add some supplements to the soil in order to transition it away from uh, what the moss is loving about it. Um, you can also, uh, I mean, like you'd have to do that piece with the soil and supplementation, but. I think another thing that we have done in the past, as you're opening the canopy up, um, you'll see that um, the understory will change. So I don't know if that moss is like out in a pasture or if it's in the woods. So those are two different, I mean, not too different, but you might approach it a little bit differently. But like I said, I would definitely go to the soil and try and navigate um, like, equalizing it so that it's not um, moss loving. And sometimes we York rake things. So York rake is basically when you take a large rake on the back of a tractor and you scratch it, right? And you're trying to reseed within that to encourage plants that are more beneficial for your system. So um, sorry, it doesn't fully answer it, but it's it's something that I would start from in the soil. Um, also, Nikki, do you worry about poisonous plants with um, pigs on civil pasture, like um, dog strangle vine? Right. So I I only worry when they're little, and especially if they're not with their mom. So I have a ton of laurel on my land, and that's very toxic to all livestock. And so when they're little, I take it little being like they've been weaned from their mother and they've entered into being called a grower. Uh, and so there might be 13 weeks or whatnot. Um, I usually cut out all of the poisonous. Do I have to? I'm not sure. I just don't want to take that chance. And so usually by the time that they're like um, probably but I, I do it by how big they are too. I always forget how old they are. But by the time that they're like five months, say, I usually stop caring. And so I have all of my adults, like my breeders and stuff are totally in with um, Laurel everywhere. And they're smart, right? Pigs are really smart. They figure it out. 
Um, but I just get nervous when they're little that if they have a small amount, their bodies are so small that they could potentially um, do that. I, I think it's worth experimenting with a little bit to see if they can withstand a little bit. But um, in the past, I've just cut out what I've seen and then waited till they get like, I don't know, four to five months old. And then I feel a little bit better about um, exposing them to toxics. Toxins, and if they have enough to graze or till, or if they have enough land, they're not going to be like all animals. They're not as inclined to go to the poison, right? Like they might try a little bite and find out that it's very bitter or not palatable. So, <clears throat> yeah, that's my suggestion. So that looks like all the questions that have come in. I did just want to, I want to reiterate something that came through the chat to everyone, but in case somebody is not seeing the chat, um, one of our participants must know uh, some information about uh, USDA and uh, is saying a note of caution. If one is creating pasture in woodlands where the land is wet and stumps are removed to make the land plantable, the producer may risk future eligibility issues with USDA programs. So he's mm -hmm. advising that you contact the USDA FSA and NRCS office for a wetland determination if uh, you are planning such a conversion. So um, good information to have. Maybe I will also include that information in um, my monthly correspondence email with all of um, all of our project participants so that this way here they don't get going down the road uh, without, you know, crossing all their T's and dotting all their I's first. And also um, I know, that, can I just, or say something on top of the yeah. USDA thing, um, that each town, like when you're purchasing land, they have a conservation commission and they usually have to come out and observe your land as to what you're doing and they will tell you where the wetlands are and tell you, or at least they have in my town, tell us like where we cannot and where we can. So you also have a town um, that has a lot of information to help support you in that as well. Great, thanks, Nikki, for that follow-up. All right, well, those are all the questions that have come through. We are at 11 o'clock now. So um, the last thing that I would ask all of our participants for is to do our post-evaluation survey. Again, um, Mackenzie just posted the, uh, the link to get to our Slido questions. So go ahead and click on that. The access code is SAR, capital S-A-R-E. Um, there are a few extra questions um, as compared to the pre-evaluation questions, but we do appreciate you taking the time to um, fill those out and answer them for us as it helps guide us and give us uh, the information we need for our reporting uh, for our, our project. So um, aside from that, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, these, this was recorded, so uh, along with the PowerPoint presentation, it will be posted on our website soon. Um, I will correspond and follow up with everybody uh, when those have been posted. Uh, also, just feel free at any time to email